A mountain, Carl Sandburg said, is something that's fastened down, something you can count on. And Mount Franklin, fastened down and presiding over this borderland for aeons of time, has long been the touchstone for a man who spoke his feelings for this mountain in 1954. It was eight years after he returned from World War II. When I got home, Mount Franklin was still there. It's still there today. It's still the same. And I feel a certain happiness about living just as close to it as I can get. And even though he's traveled the world, the man speaking those words still lives on the flanks of that mountain. Brush Strokes of Life is presented on News Channel 9 by Adair Margot Gallery, the El Paso Museum of Art Foundation, and Harding Orr and McDaniel Funeral Home, preferred year after year. During the first decade of the 20th century, El Paso was a growing town of about 30,000 people. The century and the attitudes were brand new, and it was into this exciting time that Thomas Calloway Lee Jr. was born, July 11th. 1907. In 1907, Tom Sr. was the police court judge, and he was so happy to have a son, he wanted everybody in town to celebrate. So he went to the jail, and he turned loose all the drunks and freeloaders who had been picked up the day before. The elder Tom Lee had come to El Paso from Missouri in 1901 with a law degree. He married Miss Zola Utt, became an important man in town, so young Tom grew up in a prosperous, loving home, and in some ways a more peaceful time. Compared to now, El Paso was quieter and slower and more enjoyable. A town on the verge of a major change. The horseless carriage had, had come in all right, but there were still some buggies and, and uh, horse-drawn vehicles. Those buggies and horses and motor cars shared the often dusty streets. It was a place where he learned early to love the history, the landscape, the mountains, and the dazzling light of the desert southwest. It's the prime mover of everything I've done, I think. The quality of light here, uh, the, the uh, sharpness of contour in the atmosphere, and the sense of space and structure. His appreciation of the Southwest was evident very early. I knew a good deal about the history of the town because my parents were interested in it. He painted one of his earliest murals on the dining room wall in his parents' home in 1933. And it has, it has a lot of whimsy and fun uh, to the piece. I mean, you, you have all of the symbols of the West, everything from a road runner to a rattlesnake. There's a skunk there to the, in, to the side. You have the cowboy with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth, you know, after the uh, longhorn. You even have uh, an adobe house, um, an outhouse. There's even someone sitting in the outhouse and he did it to entertain his little brother Joe. Tom likes to tell us that uh, his mother was just scandalized when she saw that he painted, you know, the outhouse occupied. Through his father, he was familiar with two of the most famous people of El Paso. One was General John Black Jack Pershing. Once when Tom Jr. was sick in bed, he discovered the advantages of having a father who was good friends with the general. Uh, John Pershing had the parade uh, go two blocks out of the regular route to come by so that I could look out the window under quarantine with a, with a scarlet fever and uh, see the soldiers go by and the artillery caissons and so on. It was great really stuff, great. really great stuff. <laughs> and later when Pershing was in France during World War I, Tom exchanged letters with him. He said that he was sorry I wasn't there right age to be a soldier because he knew when I grew up I'd be a good one and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Very proud. Yeah. <laughs> and there was Pancho Villa. Tom Sr. had once arrested Villa's wife Luz Corral Villa for arm smuggling and Villa did not like Tom Lee Sr. No, I, I, the feeling was mutual. <laughs> 
Pancho Villa threatened to kidnap Tom Jr. and his little brother Joe, so his dad, who was the mayor of El Paso by now, assigned a police escort for the boys to and from school every day. That was a mixed blessing. I loved that whole excitement about, you know, we're about to be kidnapped by Pancho Villa. Um, the only thing I didn't like about it was that the, some of the guys in my grade at school, you know, out on the play, yeah, yeah, the mayor's son, you know, and you'd have to fight, you know. <laughs> that was rough. Yeah. These were dicey times along the border. El Pasoans would crowd onto the banks of the Rio Grande to watch the fighting of the Mexican Revolution. It was here on Golden Hill. We call it Pill Hill now because of all the doctor's offices. But it was here that Tom, for the first time, saw a man killed in battle. He had a neighbor named Mr. Pittman who had a telescope that he used to watch the stars and planets. But Mr. Pittman's neighbors also came by and used that same telescope to watch the fighting over in Juarez. I remember it as vividly as the first man I ever saw killed in, in action was a uh, there's an irrigation ditch about a block from the old Juarez racetrack, and they were using it as a kind of a of a foxhole place for a charge around the racetrack property into the town. And I saw a fella get up out of the dry irrigation ditch and get hit and fall down. And another guy came from down someplace out of view and came in and rushed and got this guy's rifle and then ran like hell around the, the out of sight. Well, that was the first time I saw any combat. <laughs> I was uh, 12 years old. And it would be many years before Tom Lee would again see the horror of war. Brush Strokes of Life is presented on News Channel 9 by Adair Margot Gallery, the El Paso Museum of Art Foundation, and Harding Orr and McDaniel Funeral Home, preferred year after year. Tom Lee showed artistic talent when he was just a child. In 1909, his father was away on business in Kansas City, and Mrs. Lee wrote him a letter. The two-year-old Tom drew a small figure of a man at the end of the letter. It was his first work of art. And she had sent it to Dad, and pleased him so that he had it framed and it hung in his office. In a western town with a history of rough and tumble cowboys, being an artist was not the normal occupation. Dad said, yeah, my oldest boy, is, he wants to be an artist. And now Zola, that was my mother's name, now Zola's got Joe, the younger one, studying the valley. And if you can think of anything funnier than a a family with an artist and a fiddler in it, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Even though Tom Sr. encouraged his son's talent. He, he really wanted his sons to do what they wanted to do because he had a kind of a fight to do, to get a degree in law and to come out to the West. Young Tom was editor of the yearbook at El Paso High, and his illustrations made the yearbook stand out. When he neared graduation, a magazine illustrator saw this portrait Tom drew of Helen Moore and suggested that he attend the Chicago Art Institute. For a boy from a little West Texas town, Chicago was the other side of the world, and it worried his mother. She had brought him up in the Baptist church, and she didn't like the thought of her oldest son far away in a big city full of gangsters and fast women and painting nudes in art class. Uh, the, the art teacher at, uh, in uh, high school was named Gertrude Evans. Uh, she was a, a rather homely person, but good-hearted and a highly cultivated lady and well-educated. And uh, she persuaded Mother that it was not all sinful. So Tom Sr. cashed in a life insurance policy and told his son, that's all you'll get, make it last. Father and son posed at the train station, and the young artist was on his way. 
At the Chicago Art Institute, a famous muralist named John Norton became his mentor. He said, I got a new commission. I'm going to need a, an apprentice. And, a, and, a, and, a, and a, he didn't use apprentice. He said, I need an employee to help me with it. Would you like to go to work for me? He said, don't worry, I'll pay you. So he helped Norton paint murals in public buildings throughout the Midwest. Tom was learning his trade. In 1927, the 20-year-old artist married a fellow art student named Nancy Taylor from Indiana. And in 1930, John Norton said he should go abroad to study. So Tom and Nancy boarded a ship, and for three and a half months, they immersed themselves in the art and culture of Europe. They visited the Louvre in Paris, where he saw the murals of Delacroix. In Italy, they visited Florence, the Sistine Chapel, the work of Piero della Francesco. It was a glorious time, and he drew and sketched the places and the people. Back in Chicago, they lived on Fullerton Street, and he worked another three years creating murals with John Norton. But Norton was dying with cancer. He said, Tom, it's time for you to leave. Be a, row your own boat. And he said, now you go out to West West, your, your land, and." Uh, place you love and you work work out there Tom and Nancy moved to Santa Fe and Tom built a one-room adobe cabin and it was a very great time and, uh, very primitive uh, we were very happy the art of that time shows the simplicity and color of that life it was a sweet and romantic time but Nancy suffered a ruptured appendix a doctor in Santa Fe operated but an infection set in they moved to El Paso, where Nancy died on April 1st, 1936. It was a dark year for Tom Lee, and it shows in his painting, Lonely Town. That year, his wife died in April, his grandmother died in June, and his mother passed away in December. That was done right after all the important women in his life died, and kind of um, depicting uh, this area where he lived as a very lonely place with a lone woman with her back turned. It was a long process of, of sorrow in there, and so I left Santa Fe forever and went back to my home in El Paso. And he was back in El Paso to stay. Moving back to El Paso, Tom Lee settled into his work, and much of it consisted of painting murals in public buildings. The Brannigan Cultural Center in Las Cruces, in the Hall of State in Dallas, the Post Office in Odessa, Texas, the Postal Department Building in Washington, D.C., the Post Office in San Antonio. In 1938, he was painting the Pass of the North mural here in the Federal Courthouse in El Paso. He had been widowed for about two years when a lovely young woman named Sarah Dighton from Illinois was visiting friends here in El Paso. They had Tom over for dinner that night, and I thought, well, a pretty attractive young man. And the next day he called and said, could he have a date? Sure, I said. And that night, did you propose? That's right. Mm -hmm. I said, you have to ask my father. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old-fashioned we were in those days. Two months later, they were married. In letters too tiny to see, he wrote Tom and Sarah, 1938, on the Plainsman's powder horn. I had never known a no, painter it's, before. It's <laughs> some kind of chemistry that you recognize immediately, and that was my girl the first time I saw her. Mm -hmm. Sarah and Tom settled into life in El Paso, and Sarah became the indispensable partner. She even helped in painting the mural in the El Paso Public Library. Her name appears with Tom. I did the yucca in the painting. So it gave Isn't you a that right? Of so I was, I was well coached. Tom formed a partnership with book designer Carl Herzog, and he illustrated books and drew advertisements for friends in the retail business. And one day, out of the blue, a telegram. This was in 1940, 1941. Early 1941, I got a telegram signed Life Magazine Staff. Would you paint Trooper at Fort Bliss? One portrait I did was of a Sergeant Bieber, who was an old time China hand and brother. He stepped around. He, he, a great, great type of officer. 
From 1941 to 1946, his work with Life magazine took him to war. First aboard ship in the cold North Atlantic. The most action he saw there was a fierce hurricane. The 12 degree list to port and with the forward gun knocked clear off by the seas and uh, the uh, overhead in the chief's quarters just uh, open sky. But the storm did all that damage. Uh -huh. uh, we, uh, we roped ourselves when we had to move uh, uh, on the open deck. But later in the South Pacific, he saw the deadliness of war for the first time since he was a boy when he saw a man killed in the Mexican Revolution. In the South Pacific, he saw and painted the destruction of the aircraft carrier Wasp. He recorded the pilots and the amazing work they did off the USS Hornet and made all of America a witness to the fierce battle of Santa Cruz. And he followed the United States Army Air Force around the world, Iceland, England, Tunisia, Italy, and China, where he got a whole new perspective on culture and art and light. But all this was just prelude to one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Peleliu, a small island in the South Pacific. The Japanese had it. The Marines were told to take it for the airstrip. The Marines landed, and Tom Lee was with them. And the last part was the, the thing that changed my life. Was, the invasion of Peleliu. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I chose to, to do it on my own. I did, had no orders to do it. His boat was commanded by a Captain Farrell. But I found out from Farrell when he, when he got back that of uh, 28 under his command in that LCVP, seven of us got off the beach. And four of those seven were in the PM ward in Philadelphia. It was kind of rough. <laughs> And I went on and saw the guts lying on the ground with the flies on them, you know. He says it seemed like someone else was there watching the carnage, but he did his job so the people back home could understand. And like the Marines, he faced the same danger from a Japanese machine gunner. He wasn't very good, thank God. <laughs> He'd keep overshooting and then undershooting. But anyway, we got in. He says it was impossible to sketch or write during the landing. There was too much hell, too much chaos. But he memorized the scenes, he memorized the faces, so he could paint them later. I guess it gave me a confidence that, and a, a pride that uh, has never left me. It has also given me a, a very deep, and strong feeling about uh, how good it is to be alive and sometimes how good it is to be dead. I, uh, it's hard to say, but it's with me. He is an icon uh, for anyone who served in World War II who was in one of the uh, areas, the theaters, where Tom recorded the war. They know Tom Lee, and he is the essence of what they experience. 1,252 Americans were killed, almost 11,000 Japanese. Tom Lee had the sensitivity to see and understand, and the devotion to duty to get it right. Back from the war, he finished the wartime paintings and got reacquainted with his family. Life magazine sent him to sketch and write about the beef cattle industry in America, and he turned that into a book. But in working on that, he became more interested in the color and tradition of the bullfight. My fascination was with the animal. I loved it. The, the strength and power of those bulls. And then I found the matador with the same problem that some of the Marines had, you know. <laughs> Here's the big guy with the 
scythe going to strike me down. Only these are horns. But his creative juices were flowing, and paintings and drawings were not enough. So he taught himself to write books. I had no idea how to do it. I taught myself how to do it. Rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. The Brave Bulls became his first novel. Others followed The Wonderful Country, The Hands of Cantu, The Primal Yoke. He also wrote a two-volume history of the King Ranch. The Brave Bulls and The Wonderful Country were turned into movies. And the world premiere of The Brave Bulls was at the El Paso Plaza Theater in 1951. And Tom himself appeared as Peebles the Barber in The Wonderful Country, drawing a bath and giving a haircut to a reluctant Robert Mitchum. In 1947, he entered a painting called The Shining Plain in a competition in Dallas. He was proud of it, and he saw it as a way to return to the art world after the war. The picture was rejected because the art world had changed. So he kind of determined at that point, I think, that he'd go his own way. He would paint what he saw and paint it in the way the subject demanded. Most artists, at least artists of the 20th century, they kind of see it as their role to interpret what's around them. They bend the subject to fit they their style. To fit their style, exactly. Where Tom is much more interested in what's out there. I mean, he finds it, the world in an inexhaustible place of fascination. And, um, it, you know, he's talked about his subject has been God's majestic handiwork, the Almighty's majestic handiwork, not his own internal interpretation. From his illustrations to his novels and murals and portraits, you can see the detail from the eye of the master draftsman, the eye of the artist who respects his subject. But of all his work, this is Tom Lee's personal favorite, a portrait of his wife, Sarah in Summertime. He painted it in 1947 after he returned from the war. I'm proud because I know her. Well, it was everything about coming back from the war. It was everything, painstakingly crafted from the preliminary drawing to the final painting. It's the woman he loves, and behind her, the landscape of his beloved Southwest. The portrait of Sarah would be another turning point, because that was kind of a votive offering, I think he used that terminology. Always doing his best, it's the notion of a job well done. In reviewing all of Tom's work, I never sensed any shortcuts to anything. You begin to see the, um, the background that he gives us of clearly El Paso and how important mm -hmm. this area and the mountains are to him. Here you have almost a, a Renaissance man, a man who is a muralist, who is a, a painter of uh, canvases on easel, an easel painter. He is a writer. He, is, uh, he was a war correspondent. I mean, the man had so many talents, and he dedicated his whole life to recording uh, this region. I've just been a lucky guy trying to get along, and I'm, my luck has helped me to produce work that I'm not ashamed of. And I have been blessed by friends and by family. His murals, his paintings of war, his books all show a life of dedication and devotion to his friends and to his family, to his country, and to his beloved Mount Franklin. El Paso gallery owner Adair Margo says that Tom Lee's art is his autobiography. It is an eloquent story. This mountain has always been central to the heart and the mind of Tom Lee. He lives on the sunrise side so he can always see the new day coming. And he's fond of the Carl Sandburg quote that says, a mountain is something that's fastened down, something you can count on. For all his life, Tom Lee has been fastened down by his love for his family and his friends and for El Paso. And his life and his character and his art are things we can count on. I'm Nick Miller. Good night.
Brush Strokes of Life was presented on News Channel 9 by Adair Margot Gallery, the El Paso Museum of Art Foundation, and Harding Orr and McDaniel Funeral Home, preferred year after year.